Hello everyone and welcome back to Flight Sim 2020. We are here with the Sim Skunk Works F104G, which I have gotten questions about previously, especially when it comes to breaking the sound barrier. And so we'll go over some things, but I'm hardly qualified to make a tutorial about it or anything like that. I have not read the nearly 700 page official flight manual, uh, much to the dismay of the creators of this, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, I have some basics down, and to a large extent, I try to get a feel for how to fly it rather than be especially rigorous, so much to the pain of people who like rigor. Uh, but it is more enjoyable in a sim sense to crash my way through it, I guess you could say. But anyway, uh, we will take a look at how to do basic things. I have managed to land it dead sticks, so I can say I've got that in my belt. Uh, so here we are with NASA delivery at Edwards Air Force Base, and it is a, fair, a very good rendition of it. I mean, the details are nice. The cockpit is wonderful, uh, uh, DCS world standards, if you will, um, study level sort of thing. And so for the price at the marketplace now that it's on sale, it's very, very good. Uh, of course, we do not have working weapon systems, but we do have a lot that does work. And one thing we do have is the external tanks, and so Control Shift J brings up the key, uh, the knee board. I don't know why it's con not Control Shift K, which knee board you would think, but anyway. Uh, so the knee board is the way you want to modify the fuel, and we can load the tip and pylon tanks here. And you'll note that it changes the drag index, so you are going to have more drag like that. And that's one of the features of this plane in comparison to some of the others. A certain amount of realism there that you don't often get with planes in Flight Sim right now. There are plenty of other startup options and uh, some information for TACAN, etc. And you have the basic checklist here as well. But we can uh, not click the mirrors, just click the top of it somehow. Somehow we can click the top of this with and close it, but uh, we can just do Control Shift J. I'm sure. Okay, so there is another hot point to click and bring it up instead of using Control Shift J. But I find Control Shift J easier, and you don't accidentally click other things when you use it. So we have some little warning lights here. It always starts with these, and the generator is out somehow. Uh, so I guess we're basically running on battery at this point. Uh, so we will want to click the generator. I I don't entirely understand the electrical system whereby uh, starting one generator eliminates the lights for both. But uh, next we have the autopilot disconnect and inertial nav fault, and that we just align the INS. And so at first it's constant. And the uh, master warning is related to the INS as well. And once the INS is aligned, the nav ball will be properly oriented as well. I think when it starts blinking, we can go to nav, and then the lights are off, so we are ready to go. So we now have the external tanks on the outside, which is going to affect the plane dramatically. So. Uh, make sure that you understand uh, this this is not a plane to do sightseeing with it is very badly handling at low speeds and trying to do a high angle of attack which often happens when you're weaving through things trying to take a look at stuff i'd say every single time that i've crashed in this it is because of sightseeing trying to sightsee with it so just don't uh there's not uh, flight sim currently is a very sightseeing heavy sort of sim, uh, but this is this is more of a sort of not sightseeing kind of thing. Maybe an around the world trip would be fun with this, and I'll think about that. So takeoff speeds are high. You can see we're even having to pull up pretty severely at 200 knots. Landing gear. I do have the afterburner on right there, so afterburner effect. It doesn't have a very uh, long sort of afterburner plume thing going. It just has the lit effect inside the engine for the most part. So uh, people asked about breaking the sound barrier. At low altitude you're probably not going to be able to do it, especially with the wingtip tanks, but just in general probably not. 
but uh, it does, in my experience, and again, this is just from trying to fly it, not like using the afterburner in certain cases. <laughs> so, just sort of keep that in mind. But it's this sort of turn where I'm sort of yanking the stick, where it can just go off kilter and start going into an uncontrolled spin. You can see the wingtip tank flutter, which is nice, that's an interesting effect. But that'll give you an idea also the kind of stress that you're putting the airframe into. So we're not gonna get much of interest down here. Let's go up. One thing I've noticed is that if we light the afterburner and try to go up very severely, and you can sort of hear the afterburner effect right now. Uh, there, you can see the RPM quit on us. And so I'll bring it out of afterburner. So there's non afterburner thrust now. If I try to laugh, light the afterburner now, it's not happy with it. But I think if we let it cool down, it'll be all right. I don't, I, again, this is probably very well detailed in the manual, but I just went with testing. Now, now the afterburner is operating fine. So we can recover that situation. There are multiple manuals for the for the plane. I joked about the 700 page one. That's the, actually the official flight manual. That, and when I say official, I mean like the one they gave actual pilots. So whether that's helpful or not in this case, I don't know. Uh, it really depends on whether the plane is exactly right with all those systems. And some of those are just not going to be useful in the context of this. Like uh, the reconnaissance camera, right? Uh, there are a lot of functions that you probably won't need. There is a quick start manual though, and so a hints, a hints file, and so that might be a little bit more useful. One thing it does talk about in the hints manual is the boundary layer control system, and it's actually 83% that you don't want to put the throttle below if you've got the flaps down because you will not get enough lift in that case and there will just be instability. So yeah, make sure that when you're landing you have the throttle set to a high enough setting. You are going to land at a very high speed. That's just how it is. So that you'll land at a much higher speed if you try and throttle down. That is uh, the rub, if you will. Uh, it looks like I don't have the fuel on the right tank right now. I probably wanted uh, fuel on the tip tank or pylon tank. Right now we've been draining from the main tank, which is not great. I really should have done that earlier. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, the external tank fuel selector is right over there. And now I wish I could transfer between the tanks, but not so much. That is not so much a possibility here. Okay, we're at 30,000 feet, and we'll at least see whether we can break the sound barrier with the tanks on, with the extra drag. So, flattening out and igniting the afterburner, and we'll ignite it level. As you approach the transonic region, the drag will naturally push you down. So that's not a... You don't have to worry about that. You know, there's the whole uh, nosing down a little bit in order to break the sound barrier, but uh, it'll, it'll do that all on its own, frankly. Okay, we're experiencing the massive drag close to the sound barrier, and that's why we're going down. And the afterburner decided to quit on me. Okay. Well, great. Okay, it's back. 
Hmm. Well, I don't know what the afterburner is trying to do, but we'll, we'll go up a little bit more before trying to break the sound barrier then. And maybe for safety's sake, pay attention to the equivalent angle of attack there. Okay, uh, the dial sort of makes a sort of tick when we pass Mach 1. It's a uh, sort of noticeable change that it does. And we have the onset of severe drag here, and that's one reason why you will want to be higher up. And also to make sure not to try and go higher until you get to Mach 1.2. I don't know how easy it's going to be to continue accelerating with the t uh, outboard tanks. Um, the tip tank is almost done. We could probably jettison those soon. We could prob we could do that with the pad potentially. I don't know. Um, could select those too. Um, considering the manual release doesn't actually seem to light up. There's an external store jettison thing there, but that might jettison all of them. I don't think this works normally. Oh, we're going down quite a lot. But yeah, part of the interesting thing about flying this is it's not easy to figure out. Let's see if uh, via the kneeboard we can in flight get rid of the wingtip tanks. Uh, it looks like the tip tanks have priority over the pylon tanks though. Switching to the pylon tanks. We don't really have a whole lot of internal fuel after this, though. After we dump, dump those tanks. I guess that does lead to the question, can we adjust the fuel up here and add fuel? I guess it looks like we can. We are at 40,000 feet. And leveling out. I don't remember having so much trouble with the afterburner before, but maybe I just sort of glossed over that. Okay, we are back above the sound barrier. Indeed, no sonic boom effect in particular. Alright, forget it. Let's get rid of the tank, external tanks. They are off. Now we do not have that drag, presumably. Uh, well, yeah, it says drag index zero, but we'll also uncheck that just in case. I'll confess it is a little bit harder than I remember it. But yeah, the key thing ultimately is to get through the sticky part, basically between Mach 0.9 and Mach 1.2. It depends on the plane though, sometimes it's Mach 1.3, sometimes it's less. Once you get through the transonic region, the acceleration tends to go a lot quicker. And stuff like the external tanks can really hold you back and make it a little bit more difficult. So, especially right now, it might seem, well, I mean, it doesn't seem like a Mach 2 plane, does it? Because it's so reluctant to accelerate, even though we've got the afterburner on and everything. We are at 43,000 feet and approaching Mach 1.2 there. So yeah, it tends to feel a little bit sticky around Mach 1, but then once you get decisively above Mach 1.2, it'll accelerate a lot better. And then it's sort of smooth sailing until Mach 2 kind of thing. And you can see it's really picking up now that it's past Mach 1.2, it's finding it a lot easier. Also, higher altitude is better. This can go up to 60, 65,000 feet, and that's really where it likes to be, frankly. It doesn't have much wing to begin with, so it would. Ba it basically prefers not having wind res air resistance at all. Yep, in the blink of an eye, we're past Mach 1.6 here, and 
Not that it's just being at a happy altitude. The problem is you don't have enough fuel to stay here for very long. Uh, we might have been able to do it with the tanks on just if we had gotten to a higher altitude earlier. I think it's better not even to go for 30,000 feet or 36,000 feet, but to try and aim for like 45,000 feet if you want to break the sound barrier with this. The afterburner seems a lot more stable now that we have gotten up here too. And we're approaching Mach 1.2. We should probably throw down. There's not any hash marks left. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have any hash marks beyond Mach 1.9. So, but then again, if we cut the afterburner, that's a little bit... Again, the fuel flow... I've cut the afterburner, but the fuel flow is uh, unchanged. I like the afterburner. There, that's the afterburner lit. You can tell by the nozzle position. And afterburner off. There's no fuel flow change, so... Can't tell by the fuel flow. You can tell by the little flame effect there. Having demonstrated that we can eventually get to the speeds we're supposed to get to with this, and I'll try and land it. Hopefully with fuel this time. So turning around towards Nellis. Um, I think that caution is fuel low level, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well. I don't know if we're going to get all the way back to Nellis. We've got not much of a glide ratio. For most planes, they consume a different fuel rate at higher altitude because the fuel-air mixture is such that that makes sense because there's less oxygen up here and so you mix less fuel with it. Uh, the fuel flow indicator does not seem to indicate that that's a thing for the F-104 though, so that's also a pecu peculiarity at this point that I don't quite understand. Well, I think we'll try SGU again, KSGU, which I landed the F-15 at. Alright, well, I don't think I can get all the way back to Nellis, so... We'll just land at SGU. Let's see how this descends with air brakes. <laughs> Let's see if we can do some sort of... Uh, I don't think we can descend quickly enough like this though. Can we feel like an astronaut like this? Probably. Yep, just flying straight in here. Okay. Air breaks in. Well... It's not slowing down nearly enough, but... Here we go. Eek. Bit of a hop. Okay, we don't need a net this time. <laughs> okay, it, it landed. I probably hurt the landing gear just a little bit. At least it wasn't a dead stick landing this time. So yeah, the F-104. Could take some learning. Uh, if you're uh, if you're just in for a Cessna-like ride, this is not it. Um, I've flown it a few times. I mean, I I've tempted to fly it around the world, but you can see how that might be risky. <laughs> you can see how that might be a risky venture. You might be on the last leg or something and you forget one of the quirks of the plane. And then perish. But, it is certainly doable. 
It is certainly doable. You can get it up to Mach 2. You can fly it around. And it, you can look like a dart doing it. So, all that being said, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.